uh, uh, we, uh, we, we are thankful that you decided to join us tonight. And uh, we will be talking a bit about artificial insemination especially the differences between fresh chilled and uh, frozen semen. And the reason why we selected this topic was a lot of our clients essentially do like to know what's involved with each type of insemination procedure. And uh, this would be a good time to ask questions or um, have any queries we'll be happy to answer during after the seminar, or you can even send us an email and we'll be happy to answer you in a greater detail. So, uh, what we're gonna do is uh, we'll go through uh, the different, so what exactly is, uh, what's the definition of artificial insemination? Uh, again, no, everyone knows this, but if there are any new people around, um, just so it's essentially a physical act of depositing semen. It could be in a raw form or like the fresh form, or it could be an extended or a chilled semen sample, or it could be a frozen semen sample. And we deposit this directly inside the reproductive tract of mares uh, using specialized delivery systems. And these specialized delivery systems could be the special catheters or insemination pipettes. And sometimes we might even use endoscopes to go in deep enough and deposit the semen. So semen, again, can be in different forms that can be used. We can directly collect the semen off a stadium. So this would be a raw or a fresh sample. Uh, after collecting that semen, if you wish it somewhere else for a mare to be bred, you can extend this sample. So it's also called as a chilled or a shipped sample. And then of, of course, we can also freeze it for long-term storage. And then this is known as a frozen semen sample. Uh, when, so what are the advantages of doing an AI? But if you're trying to decide uh, of AI in your mare, these are some advantages that you can consider. And some of these may apply to your herd or to your uh, particular mare. So you can definitely expand or improve your herd's genetic pool. You can breed your mare for certain genetic traits uh, that are desirable in the stallion. And hopefully you can weed out some bad traits out of your mare as well. Uh, with AI or with AI artificial insemination, you do have a certain type of flexibility on breeding your mare because you don't have to have a stallion uh, on your farm. Um, that kind of also uh, saves you a lot of time, money, safety concerns with handling stallions can be avoided. So especially if you're using frozen semen, and because this semen can be stored for a long, long time, you can actually decide when to breed your mare. And that way you can essentially uh, have that flexibility of using that frozen semen whenever you want. Right. It also avoids the contact or physical contact between the mare and the stallion. Some, some mares or, or some stallions are just vicious. And then that can sometimes raise safety concerns. Uh, it can lead to trauma to the stallion of the mare kids stallion. Or if the mare gets injured uh, while breeding, then uh, it could be a bad deal for the mare as well. So the AI process in general avoids this physical contact and is a bit more safer. It's also easier to follow clean and hygienic breeding practices. Uh, when we breed our mares, we clean them up really well. We make sure that their back end is really nice and um, hygienic rather. We also handle semen in um, a hygienic manner. The extenders that we use for semen sometimes contain antibiotics. So because the stallion also will, uh, uh, when it ejaculates semen, the semen contains bacteria, semen's not a sterile product. So we can avoid all of these complications that can rise uh, by adding antibiotics to semen. Uh, we can have a chance to evaluate your stallion's fertility. So when a stallion ejaculates, we tend to check every sample for the movement, we check the sample for concentration, we, check the we check, even check the shape of the sperm cells in order to make sure that they are healthy and they are able to fertilize the egg. So it's, it gives us a really good chance to evaluate your stallion's fertility and at the same time also evaluate the fertility on the mare end, right? It gives us a tighter control on breeding practices because we are following your mares by using ultrasound exams. We know exactly the date of ovulation on your mare and that way we can also predict uh, with a reasonable accuracy a expected falling date on your mare. 
we can uh, kind of uh, we can identify if there were any um, like red flags during the semen uh, red flags during the breeding process, and then we can monitor this mass pregnancy throughout the term if there were any red flags. If you have extra semen left over, you can preserve it. You can freeze the semen for future use, especially if you have a valuable stallion. Some stallions start kind of uh, uh, tend to get older uh, and then their semen quality starts deteriorating. So if you do have a chance uh, this coming season, and if you have any semen that's left over, and if you would like to preserve genetics on your stallion, now would be a good chance to send the semen over and then we can freeze it for you, right? And then of course, it's a better marketing opportunity for stallion owners. If you have a stallion that's got good fertility, uh, it's a popular stallion. These stallion owners can uh, advertise the stallion. And of course, it's got a great economic kind of uh, advantage as well. Right? So uh, before we actually start with the AI process or before we actually start talking about types of semen in general, I just thought I would walk you through the journey inside a female reproductive tract. So after we breed a mare, uh, these sperm cells start swimming inside. They start going up the track. They start trying to reach the, where the egg usually is waiting for them, hopefully. Uh, and it's estimated that these sperm cells can actually reach the oviducts anywhere between 20 minutes up to two hours after insemination. So they're really, really fast. They're like sports cars and they literally zoom through that uterus and they will reach that oviduct really, really fairly quickly, much quicker than what we would expect them to be. Uh, also, the uterus by itself uh, is a good filtration, kind of a, uh, has a good filtration mechanism. We have lots of research that supports this, uh, this theory that the uterus is able to filter out dead or deformed sem uh, sperm cells. Because these deformed sperm cells, even if they reach the egg, may not be able to fertilize the egg. And hence, only healthy, normal, um, live sperm cells are able to swim up and lodge inside the oviduct and try and fertilize the egg to a point. The liquid portion of the semen is called a seminal plasma, and all of that seminal plasma literally pools inside the uterus uh, after we inseminate the mare, and these sperm cells essentially escape out, and then they start swimming up towards the oviduct. Once the sperm reach the oviduct, they actually form a reservoir. Uh, I, when I used to be back at the university, I used to tell students, you can imagine this sperm reservoir as a huge Walmart parking lot. And then these sperm cells essentially go and they park themselves in their designated spaces. And then they wait for the egg to be released and they wait for the egg to signal to them. And then they will start the process of fertilization. Once these eggs, once these sperm cells uh, receive the signal from the egg after ovulation, they start undergoing a process called as capacitation, which takes several hours before breeding, right? Or before, before fertilization. And hence, that, that's a very crucial kind of a mechanism or crucial physiologic process that enables these sperm cells to actually go and fertilize the egg. And hence, these sperm cells have to be present inside the oviduct before the egg is ready to be fertilized. And hence, Sometimes with fresh semen or with chill semen, we take to breed our mares even before they ovulate. Right? So these sperm cells do not go and try and fertilize the egg all at once. They actually go in waves. They, some of these sperm cells will undergo capacitation. Then these will go and try and fertilize the egg while the other cells are still undergoing that capacitation process. So they'll go in waves and they'll try and attach to the egg wall and they'll try to penetrate it and they'll try to fertilize this egg until one lucky sperm cell manages to get in and get the job done, right? Once the egg is fertilized, the rest of these cells essentially die in the oviduct. They die and then the oviduct contracts and all of these cells are filtered out and then they are filtered out as well as thrown outside by the uterus. Once the egg is fertilized, the embryo forms inside the oviduct and then it will stay there. It will grow up to about five or six days, and then it will come down inside the uterus. And if you had attended our earlier seminar about embryo transfer, that's when we tend to flush our mare for an embryo recovery, right? So not before six and a half or seven days, because the egg is still, or the embryo is still up in the oviducts. So this is essentially a pictorial diagram, as well as a true picture of how this oviduct looks like. 
move my arrow and see if you can identify this part. So the O over here is the big ovary. And this corresponds to the ovary that I've tried to draw on this picture over here. And then the I corresponds to this infundibulum. Just like its name suggests, the infundibulum, it's like a funnel-shaped structure and it tries to capture the egg. So the oviduct is a hollow, long tube, and this, uh, this egg that's captured by the infundibulum then travels, and it goes all the way down, and it reaches this portion that's labeled as A, and that's the ampulla. This is where the egg waits for the sperm cells, right? Once this may has been inseminated, and this is the UT, is the uterine uh, side of things, these sperm cells will try and enter the oviduct, and they will then lodge in this distal portion of the oviduct called as the isthmus. And you can, you can see this picture, the cotton that I've drawn over here that shows the isthmus. And here is where these sperm cells essentially form the reservoir. This is the parking lot. This is that Walmart parking lot I was talking about. And this is where they are gonna start, they're, they're gonna undergo capacitation. They're gonna wait for the egg. And once the egg starts giving them a signal, they will start swimming up towards the egg. They will meet the egg in this ampulla and they will try and fertilize it, okay? So it's, it's a complicated process. The, the oviduct by itself has its own little biologic environment. It's quite different from the uterus. And the egg essentially matures, the sperm cells kind of mature inside that oviduct and the oviductal environment is essential for the embryo to grow. So when we do IVF, not in horses, but if in humans, in cows, or any other species, when we actually do IVF, when we create embryos inside the lab, they try to mimic the environment that's going out inside this oviduct. Right? So again, the slide just, it's a pictorial diagram. So again, this is the infundibulum. It captures the egg. The egg kind of goes down. It waits over here in the ampulla. The sperm cells enter from the other end. They form a reservoir here in the isthmus. They go in waves and they will try and attach to the egg. The sperm cell will try and fertilize it. And if it's not successful, then more sperm cells will come behind it and they'll try to do the job. Again, this is a electron microscopy picture of an actual egg, uh, not an equine egg, but I think it's a human egg, and these are sperm cells that are attached to the surface. So you can see a lot of sperm cells attached to a single egg, and a lot of these cells will keep on trying to penetrate inside that egg. And once one of them actually does, there is a block. The egg essentially releases certain chemicals that will prevent other sperm cells from entering. It's called as a zona block, but this is, again, the pictorial, this is the diagram that actually explains that entire process. So it's a very complicated process. It's not just like you go with a drill and drill a hole inside. The sperm cells actually have a lot of these enzymes on their head, and they'll try to attach the egg. They release these enzymes, and those enzymes try to dissolve the egg wall. Now, think about it this way. The reason why I'm explaining all this is the egg has a very thick wall. You need millions of these cells to try and attach to the egg and try and drill a hole or at least weaken the wall to a point where the wall is weak enough that a sperm cell coming in the second or the third wave is going to, is going to come in able to do the job. So that's the reason we need millions of cells in order to weaken the wall when one cell can then get in, right? So hence the number game is very, very important in this aspect. So how does the uterus react? Like you put the semen inside the mare's uterus, the, the uterus also reacts in a very unique way to the semen, okay? So semen by itself is a foreign substance. If you inject a foreign substance inside a body of any individual, that body is gonna react. It's gonna cause an inflammation and it will try to that, that foreign substance, right? The semen has proteins which incite a inflammation inside the mare's uterus. And this inflammation, essentially, it's a protective mechanism. The mare is trying to clean her uterus out and protect the uterus by having this inflammation set in. However, it takes some while to get this inflammation to peak and takes about four to six hours for the mare to actually start reacting to the semen. 
And these four to six hours are the time frame where the cells can escape the uterus and then they can go up to the oviduct so they are not affected by the mare's inflammatory response, right? So once the mare gets this intense inflammation, there could be fluid production, there could be some mucus that could be produced inside the, inside the uterus. And all of this essentially washes the, the uterus out. Essentially, it's like a house cleaning mechanism. So the mare will react to the semen. It will get rid of all this seminal plasma, this fluid, the dead semen that's inside the spur, inside the uterus. And most of these normal healthy mares will be able to do this job within the first 24 hours after breeding. Now, mares, if you have an infertile mare, if you have a mare with uterine problems, then these mares are not able to do that. What, because these mares are not able to do that, they start accumulating fluid inside their uterus. And when they start accumulating fluid inside their uterus, this leads to further infection or inflammation, and then these mares don't get pregnant. It's not because the mare does not conceive. In most cases, with infertile mares, the embryo still comes down inside the uterus, but because the uterus has a very hostile environment, it kills the embryo, right? So that's the reason it's very crucial to know how the uterus reacts for individual mares. And we, what we will do uh, in most cases is we will check the mare in a few hours after ovulation to make sure that she's clean. She's been able to clean her uterus out. We'll make sure that she's ovulated. We'll make sure there's no fluid accumulation. And if not, if these mares fail to get rid of this fluid, we will lavage the uterus out. We'll put some saline inside. We will go in and physically clean the uterus out that the mare was supposed to be doing. And uh, then we'll give her some shots of oxytocin, which contracts the uterus, and hopefully this mare will then get rid of the fluid and the uterus will be clean for the embryo to grow, right? So this is how the uterus actually reacts to all kinds of semen. It doesn't matter whether it's a fresh semen sample or a chill sample or a frozen sample of semen, okay? So it, like I said before, it's literally a numbers game you have to know how many cells, how many millions of sperm cells, live normal cells that you're putting inside this mare's tract. Like I mentioned before, it takes a lot of these cells to weaken the egg wall. And if you have less number of cells to, eat, to weaken the egg wall, that lucky cat is not going to get in and do the fertilization process, right? So if there are less sperm cells, for example, reaching the uterus, like for example, if there are more abnormal cells that the uterus filters out, then these, these cells don't reach the uterus. That means you have less number of cells uh, trying to do the job, which means your pregnancy rates can fall. If your stallion is producing less number of cells or less number of spermatozoa, and that's the reason you've got to check your stallions for their concentration, then you have less number of normal cells per ejaculate, which means there are, again, less number of sperm cells available. If there are less live cells, if your stallion is producing a lot of cells, but most of them are dead, then these cells can't swim up. Again, you have less cells to do the job. If the female reproductive tract, if your mare's tract has certain problems, if she's inflamed, uh, if the mare's tract has a lot of mucus because of you know, chronic infertility, then these sperm cells get trapped and they can't swim up. And then again, they can't do the job. So we always say the dose of your semen or the insemination dose is what we call it. That is more important than the actual volume or actual amount of semen that you put inside the mare. So you could put in 100 ml of semen inside your mare, but if 99% of, of those cells inside the semen are dead, then it doesn't matter how much liquid you put inside the mare's tract, but you could put one ml of good quality semen inside, good concentration semen inside your mare's uh, tract, and it should, if it contains the adequate number of cells, those cells will still swim up and they'll still do their job. So the volume is not important. What is important is the dose of your live cells, live normal cells, right? So typically we assume that most mares should get pregnant between, after you inseminate them with maybe about 100 to 200 million live normal cells. And when I keep on repeating live normal cells, these cells have to be alive. They have to be moving in a certain direction or a forward direction, and they have to have normal shape and structure, 
right? If these cells have abnormal structures, they have a bent tail, they have two heads, they're not gonna be able to do a job. So these are some terms that we normally use and sometimes people get confused with the term. So your insemination dose, for example, is the total number of your live normal cells that are available for fertilization. So you need at least a minimum of 100 million live cells in order to do their job, right? Insemination volume is the amount of semen you're putting in. Again, like I said, the amount is not important. What is important is what's contained in that amount, right? We try to limit our volume to about 60 ml. If you put more than 60 ml inside a mare's reproductive tract, she leaks a lot of it outside. And then she has the risk of losing those cells by just throwing them out. So your insemination volume can be really small. With frozen semen, for example, sometimes we have a volume of just two straws, two straws meaning one ml. But if those two straws contain the adequate number of sperm cells, then you get good insemin or good pregnancy rates, right? Your normal cells uh, should have normal, like a normal morphology or a normal shape. So when we evaluate semen over here, we will stain the cells. We will, we will, uh, we will mix a special stain uh, and we will look at these cells under a microscope and we, will, we should be able to tell whether your stallion semen has or stallion sperm cells have normal morphology or not. And that is very crucial for fertilization. You just saw in your previous slides the complexity of that process of fertilization. If you do not have a cell with the adequate shape and the size or the movement, then these cells will not be able to do their job. Uh, we call, we, 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 uh, we classify sperm motility as a progressive um, motility, which means these cells should be moving forward. And that is what helps them to reach the oviduct. If under a microscope, if you see a lot of cells moving, but if they're going in circles, then they're not gonna do their job again. What's an extender? Extender is especially made liquid media. This liquid media contains some energy source like glucose or fructose that provides energy to these cells. And then it contains certain chemicals to balance the pH. Uh, they're called as buffers. And sometimes we may add antibiotics to extenders to reduce the amount of bacterial growth. Like I said, semen is not sterile. You will have bacteria in semen. And especially if you're shipping semen somewhere else, we don't want these bacteria to grow uncontrollably and then that can infect the mare. And hence we put antibiotics to limit the growth of bacteria in semen. I'm not saying they kill those bacteria completely, but they limit the growth so that the mare does not the mare is still able to fight that off. Then we have the last term called as post-thaw motility. As its name suggests, post-thaw meaning once you thaw the semen, frozen semen sample, we will look at it under the microscope and make sure that it's moving. The freezing process itself is very harsh. It will damage sperm cells. It will damage a lot of sperm cells during that process. So we want to ensure that before we put the semen inside your mare, there are adequate number of sperm cells moving. And that's why we, we classify that motility or this movement as a post thaw motility, and we will give it a percentage, right? So uh, if you want to breed your mare with fresh semen, so what are the advantages, what's entailed in it? So fresh semen can be used to breed your mare via natural service if you're just allowing the stallion to mount the mare and breed her or this uh, stallion could be collected on the cell. And this semen can be put immediately inside your mare uh, using artificial insemination. The advantage to that, that being you do not, you avoid contact between the stallion and the mare, and then you can process the semen. You can add a bit of extender, or you can evaluate the semen before putting it inside a mare. You could even reduce the volume of the semen that is put inside a mare because some mares will react to large volumes uh, by producing more fluid. You can also use that semen and divide it between lots of mares uh, so that with one single ejaculate, you could breed anywhere from seven to 10 mares, right? So fresh semen has the best quality uh, because it's not processed in the lab, like a chilled or a frozen sample. It 
lives the longest inside the men's reproductive tract. And with good fertile stallions, some semen uh, or some sperm cells can last even up to a week after insemination. There are plenty of reports of mares getting bred once and which did not ovulate for almost a week after breeding and they still got pregnant, right? Which means the sperm cells were still alive to do their job after a week after insemination or after, after natural service. Uh, most stallions produce more than enough cells for uh, fertilization in a single ejaculate. And hence this ejaculate, like I mentioned before, can be divided between multiple mares. You don't have to use the whole ejaculate to push inside the mare unless it's a thoroughbred industry where you have to do natural service, right? Now, if you want to preserve this, sperm, uh, this semen outside uh, and keep it for a few hours, uh, most of the semen might stay alive for a couple of hours, but after that, it will start dying off because it uses all the energy. The sperm cells will use all the energy within the seminal plasma, and then you will have to add extenders to it in order to keep it alive, right? So I'm going to show you a bunch of videos, and that might help you kind of understand what we look at. This is a fresh ejaculate that's being collected off a stallion. And I'm just going to play it. You can see there are literally millions of sperm cells on the screen. They appear to be moving really, really quickly. But because you can't see a single individual cell, really, you can say that it's got a good gross motility. It's called as a good overall motility because a majority of these cells seem to be moving. But because you can't identify each cell, we, what we do is we sometimes add a little bit of saline or we dilute the sample out with a little bit of extender. And then we can see these individual cells under the microscope. So this is after dilution. You can still see a majority of these cells are moving and they're moving in a straight line. They're not going around circles. You can see some epithelial cells around here. So this is an epithelial cell. And you can even see sperm cells trying to fertilize that epithelial cell within that gut. And they probably think it's an egg and they try to attach and try to fertilize that, right? So this again is a ejaculate, a fresh ejaculate collected off a stallion. And then you can actually see that there's a huge difference between the video that I showed and this one. Yes, you can see movement in the background, but one is it's extremely concentrated to a point that you can't see individual cells. But at the same time, you can also identify that these cells are not, not a majority of these cells are moving. So just because there's movement does not mean that the sample is good for fertilization. You have to know how many of these cells in the sample are moving. Let's talk a bit about chill samples or chilled semen. Right? So chill semen essentially is a sample that you have collected and then you have extended it with those rotator extenders we talked about. And then a lot of this sample can be kept on your farm uh, on four degrees Celsius if you have a mare that you're waiting to ovulate and then breed her. Or you could ship it if someone else requires it somewhere else. You collect your stallion on your farm, you extend it appropriately using the proper extender, and then you chill it. You essentially pack it with an ice pack in a styrofoam box, and then you ship it to the mare owner. And uh, these semen samples can stay alive for several days, uh, which of course it enables their storage as well as their shipping. But at the same time, you need to make sure that you need to add the proper amount of extender. The extender is what provides food to these cells for survival, right? So if you want these cells to survive for more number of days, you need to add an adequate amount of extender that will keep providing them nutrition, okay? Uh, like frozen, uh, like fresh semen, these cells do survive inside the track, but they don't survive as long as a fresh sample will survive because most of these uh, samples have been collected a couple of days before the mare will actually be inseminated. So for example, you, you, you're trying to get a semen sample from uh, the States, the stallions collected on a Wednesday, it'll be probably about Friday or Saturday till you get your sample. And then the semen is already two days old and starting to deteriorate. So it will not last inside your maize track for a longer time. So that's the reason you need to time your maize so that they ovulate as close to insemination as possible. 
And you can uh, extend the semen and uh, kind of store it for a short term shipping, or you can even store it on your farm itself. And then make sure that this semen is always under four degrees Celsius uh, temperature. So what we call this cold chain, you need to maintain that cold chain because the cold is what reduces the motility of the cells. These cells essentially hibernate almost. Uh, they, they become sluggish, they use less energy. And that's the reason you need to maintain that cold chain in order to preserve the energy of these cells going forward, right? Now, if you send us a chilled sample from somewhere else, we can separate the sperm cells from the extender and we can still freeze this sample. So you don't, if, if, you, if you're far away from us, we can still freeze the stallion sample for you. Uh, you don't necessarily have to bring the stallion or if you're unable to bring the stallion to the clinic, you can still uh, send us a ship sample, which we can separate and we can try and freeze it for you. Again, a couple more videos of this is a chill sample and you can still see a lot of these cells moving. They, they seem to be moving well in a forward direction and then we are gonna switch it uh, there'll be a switch over there, right there, and then you'll actually see a fresh sample of that same stallion. So you can see the difference between the fresh sample as well as the chill sample from the same stallion. Um, <laughs> this is another uh, video. Uh, this sample, semen sample, doesn't seem to be moving as well as your earlier sample. On top of that, you can also see some of these bright spots, these round bodies over there, essentially are red blood cells, uh, which means the stem bled a little bit uh, at the time of the So uh, just looking at the semen sample, you can sometimes identify bleeding, if the stallion had some inflammation or if he had trauma at the time of collection, then you can identify that just by looking at the semen sample as well. And the last slide I'm gonna show you, um, um, you can see how few of these cells are moving. This was a semen sample that was shipped to us um, back uh, in the States when I was working. And this sample actually, uh, we were even surprised that the sample survived this much because the cold pack that was sent So these cells need to be under that four degrees Celsius uh, temperature so that they can preserve their uh, energy levels. What we assume happened was that because of the long term, or long time that it took to ship the sample to us, this sample uh, essentially started kind of getting activated and to a point where these cells exhausted themselves. And then by the time we got the sample, most of these cells were dead. Right? So all of these things are quite crucial in making sure that your sample, a uh, good sample, reaches the mayor in uh, before we breed them in. Frozen semen samples are quite challenging, uh, not just to use, but also when we are planning on breeding a mare. So that's the more challenging aspect of that equine breeding program. Um, also, these cells have been processed a lot in the lab. So we essentially uh, make them go through a series of processes, then we store them under liquid nitrogen, and then that creates a big, big toll on their health. And that's the reason for Evaluate, we, we estimate about six to 12 hours. Uh, some of these samples may survive for a long, longer than 12 hours, especially if they have good quality. But if they are not of a good quality or if they have limited motility, sometimes they will survive for even less than six hours. And hence the timing of that insemination is very crucial. We will keep checking your mares till they ovulate. And then we may either breed them at ovulation or even a little bit after ovulation to ensure that the egg is available when the sperm cells reach the ovidar, right? Again, like I said before, the numbers game is very uh, important and it's more challenging in terms of frozen semen because we need to evaluate how many cells are moving after we pour the straw out. After we evaluate that, and ideally the stallion station who's collecting and freezing the stallion should be doing that, is they should be able to tell us a proper insemination dose based on these numbers. Over here, what we'll do is if we freeze the sample, we'll evaluate one straw, we will make sure that this, we put a number as to how many cells we see moving. 
And based on that number, we will tell you how many straws it requires to breed your mare. So a lot of people have this misconception about, oh yeah, you just need two to four straws to breed your mare. That's not true. Sometimes you may just need two straws. I have also put 20 straws inside a mare of uh, a mare from a stallion that had like poor motility, right? So again, it's a numbers game. You need adequate number of sperm cells present over there to do their job. And again, because it's more challenging, because sometimes the semen doesn't survive for too long inside the mare, inside the mare tract, you can have lower pregnancy rates than your fresh or chill samples. So given a choice, you should also, the first sample or first type of semen you should opt for would be a fresh sample if it's available. If a fresh sample is not available, stallion's too far away, you can ask if they sh can ship you a chill sample. If the chill sample is not available or the stallion's dead, then you can, the third resort would be the frozen sample to be your man. Again, these are a couple of uh, videos that I have. So this uh, sample froze really, really well, almost to a point where it almost looks like a, a right? So this would be an ideal uh, scenario where we actually see a good post hormone motility. I would say this uh, post has about 60 to 70% of these cells are moving in a forward direction or are progressively motile. Then, um, is this sample, and you can see a significant drop. This is a different sample, but you can see a significant drop in the number of cells that are moving. You can identify easily that there are a lot of cells in the background that are not moving um, as, as well, or they're not moving at all, right? So that reduces the number of cells that are available for your insemination, which means that this mare may have lower pregnancy rate than the mare that was bred with the earlier semen. And this last sample is, is pathetic. It literally is really bad. It's, uh, you might see one cell moving somewhere, um, but largely it's dead, right? Even the cells that are moving are kind of going in circles. If you identify this cell, these cells, a lot of these cells are just swimming in circles. They're large cells. Clearly, the sample did not freeze really well. So it is extremely crucial to check these samples before you put them inside them inside the mare. It could have come from a reputable place. It could have come from a reputable stallion. But if this sample had not been preserved well, like the stallion guys did their job, the freezing station did their job. But if there had been a break in the cold chain somewhere, then these samples can die. So hence, it is very crucial on the mare side to always check these samples before we put it inside your mare. And every sample that will be put in your mare over here will be checked. So um, what can you do? What can you guys do on your part to make uh, or to get good pregnancy rates on your uh, mare? So one is, of course, the reproduction we always call a crucial day-to-day -day process that the body needs to survive and hence you need to maintain your mares in a healthy body condition. If the mare is weak, it's thin, the, what the body does is it kind of puts the energy sources to preserving other vital functions and then the reproductive system that does get affected. So main, make sure that your body, mares are in a good body condition, you feed them well, make sure that they're maintained and taken care of really, really well. They should be up to date on their deworming, vaccination programs, uh, dental care, so that they can eat well and maintain that body condition. Try and order semen from a stallion with good pregnancy rates. Again, that's not always the case because as Murphy's law dictates, good stallions sometimes have bad semen. So at least if you do have that encounter of bad semen, you can, you should, you can seek veterinary help. You can talk to your veterinarian about strategies to get maximum pregnancy rates on your mares, even if you're using poor semen. We can tell you ideas, we can, we can develop a strategy so that we can still breed to that particular stallion semen and try and get better pregnancy rates, right? If your mare is infertile, and I'll be honest, a lot of the infertility issues are blamed on mares. Uh, poor old mares sometimes have no fault. It might just be the stallion that could have poor semen quality 
and that is leading to poor pregnancy rates. But if you do have a mare with infertility issues, contact us, we can think about it, we can work through it, and we can try and identify problems that might be preventing this mare from getting pregnant, right? Do not breed mares every single day, right? If you have a stallion on your site and if you're doing natural service, do not get this mare mounted every single day by the stallion. If you remember, we talked about how the mare's uterus reacts to semen. It takes 24 hours for this mare to get rid of the fluid, right? But at the end of 24 hours, if you breed her again and overwhelm her reproductive tract again, then this tract gives up. It says, you know what, I'm not going to contract, I'm not going to cause any more inflammation. And what's going to happen is there'll be a lot of fluid that will remain inside that mare's tract and it will lead to infertility issues. So do not breed your mares every single day. Avoid pasture breeding at all, if possible. So sometimes people will just leave a stallion with other mares and let them do their job, let nature take care of itself, and which can work just fine. But if you have mares that are not getting pregnant, then we don't know what's causing the problem. Is the stallion not being able to mount the mare? Is the mare kicking at the stallion or the mare is truly not in heat? So we don't know what's going on. And that's the reason you should avoid pasture breeding if you need good pregnancy rates. We also urge stallion owners to get their stallions checked. Stallion owners shy away from getting semen checked. And um, it's just that mentality about, oh, if I, if I don't know it, nothing's going to go wrong. That's, that's, a, that's a very um, short kind of a term, short, or rather short-sightedness. And if you are in the middle of the season and suddenly the fertility of your stallion stops, starts dropping down, then you don't know what's going on. So it always is a good idea to get the stallion checked at the beginning of the season. And during the season, if you feel that the mare pregnancy rates are dropping down, then it might be beneficial to have him checked again. Remember, fertility is contributed equally by the mare and the stallion, 50-50%. So you could have a stallion with poor semen quality that might be contributing to that problem, whereas the mare is perfectly fine and healthy, right? So do get your stallions checked, do get their semen evaluated, so that you at least know what's going on on that end. What can we do, right? On our end, what we can do to help you or get better pregnancy rates is we can time your mare very accurately and make sure that she is dead at the right time, depending on what kind of semen we are using, right? We can ensure that all semen uh, samples are evaluated. Uh, any sample that goes inside the mare is it goes under a microscope initially. We evaluate it. We know what's going inside your mare. So we can predict pregnancy rates on your mares, or we can at least um, mark a mare if we think there's a problem going on and we can communicate that to you. Uh, we can ensure that all your mares are checked for uh, any kinds of infection by doing a culture or cytology if it is needed uh, before breeding. And then if this mare is indeed infected, we can treat her and do a post-breeding exam as well as treatment if it is deemed necessary, right? If the semen is of a poor quality, we can use certain advanced techniques of insemination like deep horn insemination or endoscopic insemination. And we can deposit the semen as close to the oviducts as possible so that the sperm cells don't have to swim that long. And then there are more cells available to do their job. We can confirm ovulation and uh, the date and the time of ovulation. And that essentially goes into your breeding record that helps you know when this mare goes out, right? And then we can process these shipped samples. Uh, if, you, if you are shipping a sample, a chilled sample to breed to a particular mare, we can actually uh, process these samples, especially if they have poor motility uh, when we receive them and we can try and revive the motility by adding fresh extenders to it before it goes inside your mare, right? And then if nothing works, if all of these criteria are fulfilled and still if there are no pregnancy rates or lower pregnancy rates, then we can try and troubleshoot and try and help you uh, and figure out what's going wrong, right? 
Uh, these are the techniques that I was talking about. These are advanced insemination techniques that can be done over here. Uh, you can see the first one's called as a deep horn intrauterine insemination technique. And as you see, this insemination catheter is flexible. It's almost bent into a U. So we, uh, it, instead of just putting a straight rigid catheter inside their uterus and depositing semen, we can actually carry this catheter deep up the horn as close to the oviduct as possible. And then we can deposit that semen close to the oviduct so that these sperm cells don't have to swim a long distance to reach the oviducts and eventually the egg. Now with certain stallions, the semen quality is so poor or sometimes only one single straw or poor quality straws available. And in those cases, what we can also do is we can do an endoscopic insemination where we pass an endoscope all the way up the track of the mare and this is the opening, this papilla that you see, it's the opening to the oviduct. And we literally douse this papilla with semen. We, we spray the semen on the oviductal papilla itself so that it cuts down on the distance that these sperm cells have to travel. And you can essentially get away with low dose insemination and still get good pregnancy rates, right? So um, these are some uh, uh, these services that are available at, uh, at present at Delaney Veterinary Services. Uh, we, we are uh, quite excited about maybe starting some OC patients for uh, ICSI this season. Uh, we'll see how the response is, and we are still communicating getting with the lab about it. But uh, you can always call us, and we can, we'll be able to provide you more, so, uh, more information about these services. So uh, with that, I will end my talk and I'll be happy to answer any questions to you, uh, from you guys. So you're always welcome to pop your questions in the chat. Uh, Dr. Swan, you always have so much to share. It's quite interesting. And I love that it's it's everyone. It's not just the mayor, it's not just the stallion, it's everybody that contributes. So we need health all yeah. the way around. Right. So if, you're, if your head is full and you need to email Dr. Swan and you can yeah, totally- Yeah, you can email us, that's fine too. Sometimes it's very difficult to cover a lot of information in a small amount of space, but we'll, uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, via email or you can call us. There we go. Um, from Yanni, why is deep horn insemination not done every time? All right. So the reason why we don't do deep horn insemination each time is there are two, two aspects to it. One is the kind of semen you're using. So if you're using fresh semen or if you're using chilled semen, you typically have large volumes of semen and they also, these semen samples also have a large number of cells. So you have more cells that are available that are able to swim up and they, they can still do their job. We do deep horn inseminations usually with frozen samples. And the reason behind it is the volume of the frozen sample is really small. So if you're putting in one or two ml inside the mare's uterus, the sperm cells have to escape that one or two ml and swim a, a whole bunch, a whole distance up the, up the uterine horns and reach the oviducts. It is much easier to inseminate or deposit this small volume next to the oviduct using that special pipette. This special pipette also has a really small hole. If you have a large volume, it, it, it is gonna be very difficult to inseminate or pass that large volume through that insemination pipette. And plus with a large volume, all of that volume essentially by gravity is gonna just trickle down. So you have no benefit to it. So hence we, with large volumes, with fresh semen or chilled semen, we just use your regular AR pipette. But with frozen samples, frozen samples that are having poor motility or frozen samples with low volumes, we will do deep horn inseminations. All right. Um, does the length of time that the semen has been frozen have an effect on the motility? I have frozen 10 years old. So 10 year old frozen uh, semen. At, based on the current data that we have, uh, the simple answer is no. 
if the semen had been frozen well and if it had been stored under liquid nitrogen all this while without a break in the cold chain, then to be honest, we, we really don't know how long it will even survive. We, ha we have samples from 1980s or 1970s that are still producing pregnancies. We have samples of bulls that were frozen in the 1960s that are still producing pregnancies. So as long as that semen is stored under liquid nitrogen, uh, we, we think it will probably last forever. As long as it's been stored well, there, has, there should be no break in the cold chain. You can't take a straw out in the air and look at it and then put it inside. That's break of cold chain and that's gonna destroy the semen. Perfect. All right. What about, so if you have horses that um, pass away unexpectedly, um, if, is there something that you can preserve some of those genetics? If you're within that horse, like if a stallion passes away, if maybe say, for example, at the clinic just unexpectedly passes away, is yep. there some way you can save those genetics? Yes. So on this slide, you can, you can see this extracting and freezing epididymal semen. And that's the reason why we put that on is if you have an older stallion that passes, or not just an older stallion, any animal that unexpectedly passes away, or if you have a stallion that you're planning on gelding, uh, but you would still want a few straws that, would, uh, that you might want to preserve, uh, you don't necessarily want to jump the stallion or collect him, you can send us the testicles. You can send us the testicles. What we do is we flush the epididymis and the epididymis contains mature sperm cells, and then we will uh, freeze this, uh, these epididymal uh, sperm cells, um, just like we do with normal semen, and we can still preserve genetics on your animal. Uh, you can give us a call beforehand, or if it's an emergency thing, you can just call us and let us know that, hey, we have this animal that has died suddenly. Be happy to share uh, with you the, ad, the, the proper way of shipping, these samples to us. Ideally, these samples should not be in contact with ice directly. So if you have a styrofoam box, the simple way to do it is collect those testicles as a whole, put them in a Ziploc bag, or, uh, and then uh, put some ice packs inside your styrofoam box, get a buffer between the ice packs and the testicles so you can put some old newspapers on top, and then put the testicles on top of that, seal the box, and send it to us. And then we'll do the rest. Perfect. So as long as you have, you know, for example, if you're gelded uh, a stallion or he passed away, send them within like a day or two, 24 hours, or just as fast as you can, I suppose. As soon as possible, ideally. But we have had testicles that have been shipped to us from outside state when I was working in the States and they have been on the road for about two days and we have still managed to uh, like uh, flush and freeze that sample. Wow, that's really good. Um, another question. Um, what about between the an ICSI dose and a regular AI dose? You know, for example, even or like a frozen dose. So what are the kind of differences about dosage? So the advantage with ICSI is that you literally require one cell. I mean, that's that's where it takes one. All it takes is one is really true in terms of ICSI. Because what you're essentially doing is you say you have a straw, you have one single straw of a stallion, a very famous stallion that died. And that's the only straw available to you now in the world, right? There's no other genetics preserved on the stallion. And if you want to do XC with the stallion semen, what you can do is you can cut the straw. So we, you can cut the straw almost into 10, like each time you try to do an XC, you can cut a tiny amount of the straw and you can thaw only that cut portion out, and then you can pick up one single cell and push it inside the egg. And if you have multiple eggs, you can do it with each egg. And that way you are injecting multiple eggs per uh, single uh, tiny amount that you have thawed. So the, um, the, the dose as in general, as you're talking about, is a difference between one cell and millions of cells, literally. Because when you, so when you have with your frozen, I'm sorry. So when you have such a small amount, yeah. maybe, um, or if you have more, say, mares that are 
you're either struggling or as an ET or like, when would I use XC? So the, the, the main reason why you would, the two main reasons why you would use XC would be one is if the stallion semen is extremely poor to a point where it can't do its job properly. So that's when you have to help the cell, help, help the sperm cell actually reach inside the egg, which the sperm cells by itself cannot do, right? Uh, so that's one uh, major indication for ICSI. And then the second indication is if you have limited number of uh, genetics or straws available, the stallions long gone, that's, these are the only pool of samples you have. Then if you wanna keep on you know, propagating that line ahead, then you can use tiny, tiny pieces of that straw each time you kind of cut it and thaw it and then use that for ICSI. Wow, that's pretty incredible. So you really get to really manipulate those individual cells. Yeah, you literally, I mean, it, under a microscope, you're essentially looking at a big, huge egg that you have held with a pipette and a vacuum. And you have a tiny needle that is hollow and it's a glass needle and you have a sperm cell inside that needle and you go in and you push it inside the egg and you inject that cell inside the egg. That's why it's called that's XC is intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So you're essentially injecting the cell inside the egg, cytoplasm. Awesome. Who else has some good questions? Exciting stuff. Everyone's just probably like, oh my gosh, my head, it's so full. There's so much good information out there. Again, like I said, I mean, it doesn't have to be right now, but they can always email us. They can call us. We'll be happy to chat. You betcha. I think everyone's getting excited for Christmas. Christmas and then, Christmas and then breeding season, right? Isn't that how the world runs? <laughs> Looking forward to it. <laughs> but yeah, if you have any questions, you are always welcome to contact the clinic. Um, Things are going to get a pretty exciting at the clinic soon. Uh, Mayor's coming in for foaling, you know, get some stallions moving in here. Um, yeah, it's exciting. Exciting times after Christmas here, things start rolling and good stuff. So if you don't have any other questions, you're always welcome. I will get this uploaded to the uh, YouTube link. Um, my, the, my guru, Penny, she's the, she's not my bestie and she puts it up for me. But yeah, I hope everyone has a wonderful Christmas. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget, we do have a few more days left on our 12 days of DBS Christmas. We're giving stuff away. So I am a day behind between school is crazy right now. We're getting ready to wrap up for Christmas. House is crazy. So um, I am trying to get everyone under there, get everyone posted and showing on there. And oh, it's exciting time. I'm feeling so good about this Christmas. So stay warm. Stay safe. If you have questions, you know who to contact. That's your guy. Uh, but yeah, have a wonderful Christmas. Happy New Year. And don't worry, we have all kinds of uh, repro department stuff coming up on uh, in the new year. We've got more posts coming. So don't be shy. Please contact us if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys. Again, feel free to ask us any questions. Sometimes people hesitate asking questions thinking, oh, I, I think they might think we are stupid no uh, any no question stupid just ask us we'll be more than happy to share awesome well thank you so much thank have you. a safe, safe and holiday happy holidays yeah, stay, warm. stay warm stay safe and drive carefully <laughs> drive carefully exactly all right